And we now move on to questions to the Minister of Education. Can I advise members that question number two has been withdrawn? And I call William Humphrey. Deputy Speaker, question number one. Based on the current information uh, available to me, the start date for the construction of the new Eden Dairy Nursery School is likely to be March 2016, with a six month contract period. The project will deliver a new double unit nursery school for 52 pupils on uh, a new site at the junction of Larnock Way and Mayo Link, which is in the vicinity of the existing school. Construction work will be taken forward under the Belfast Strategic Partnership Agreement between the Education Authority and the strategic partner, Amy FMP. A supporting business case for the project has been approved and the purchase of the new site is complete. The total cost of the project, including lands, is in the region of £1.2 million. The existing Eden Dairy Nursery School is currently located in the grounds of Glenwood Primary School. Therefore, the delivery of this project not only provides much needed additional space for both schools, but also provides the new Eden Dairy Nursery School with new accommodation on a separate site and its own identity that will allow the school to forge stronger cross community links due to its location. Call William Humphrey for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Indeed, my colleague Brian Kingston and I had a meeting with the Chief Executive of the Education Authority on Friday, and she confirmed that. So I thank the Minister for the announcement for the investment in the area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister uh, has alluded to it. <coughs> Clearly, this then frees up space in Glenwood Primary School. The Minister knows I've raised this before with him. Can the Minister um, advise the House uh, as to when work may start on the extension and refurbishment of the Glenwood Primary School, which is the hub school for Greater Shankill uh, in the area, which is much needed, as the Minister will know. Uh, uh, and, and it is important, I think, in the view of the governors, teachers, uh, local politicians, and of course the parents, the, the, the members school should be on the question. current site. Uh, I haven't got the details in front of me in relation to Glenwood Primary School, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to uh, forward more information on to the member. The member will be aware that I'm acutely uh, aware of the issues in and around that area after a development proposal and discussions with local community representatives and schools about how we strategically plan educational provision in that area. I'm delighted to have moved on with Eden Dairy Nursery School and hope to be in a position to uh, move on with other projects in the area as soon as possible. Moving on, I call Claire Hanna. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions 3, 4, 7, 8 and 10 together. The Investing in the Teaching Workforce Scheme is currently under development in collaboration with the teaching unions and employers, and criteria for the scheme is still to be finalised. It is intended that the scheme will be launched early in spring 2016. After all options have been explored, all relevant criteria will be published at that stage. While I acknowledge there has been some disappointment expressed about the proposed parameters of the scheme, it must be remembered that the scheme will have the potential to provide up to 500 permanent teaching posts for recently qualified teachers, and up to 500 teachers will be able to retire early. In the absence of this scheme, neither will happen. I call Claire Hanna for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for his answers. I think uh, there has been upset with the scheme, and I think um, I, I don't think we can consider them as uh, new posts because they are obviously just replacement posts. It's not actually creating new employment. Um, can the Minister, after uh, 10 years of his party uh, holding the education uh, portfolio, comment if young teachers in training or considering teacher training uh, have been told that they shouldn't expect a job in this field? Can he give any advice on uh, what work they should hope to get after their qualification? qualifications are achieved? Uh, thank the member for her question. Th these are new jobs. These jobs would not come online for perhaps five or ten years. There is no other department has been able to introduce a scheme to release 500 jobs onto the market in the next financial year. There is no other private investor, foreign or domestic, has been able to produce 500 jobs in the next financial year. Yet there are parties in this chamber and outside this chamber who are manipulating the genuine concerns of some teachers around this matter and have, in my opinion, acted irresponsibly around this matter in the hope of advancing both individual political careers and party political careers. Uh, in relation to what career choices individuals should take, I am on record as saying I cannot and will not give individual career advice, but anyone taking up a career in teaching should consider carefully uh, all the issues around taking up that career, including will they be able to obtain full-time employment at the end of their training period. I think that's a sensible thing 
for a minister to say. What career choices people take is, fully, is a matter for them. There are, there is a wide range of options out there. All I am doing is putting down a marker saying to young people, or not so young people, consider all the options going forward. But I, can, I know this, that if this scheme goes ahead, there will be 500 more newly qualified teachers getting jobs this year than there would have been. And if the scheme doesn't go ahead, there will not be 500 newly qualified teachers getting a job, and there will not be 500 teachers over 55 years of age retiring early. So I have been proactive in trying to assist newly qualified teachers in obtaining employment, and I'm also respecting the wishes of individual teachers who are close to retirement and who wish to retire to allow them to do so to uh, revitalise and refresh our teaching workforce. I call Alistair Ross. And can I say that I understand why the, the Minister will be attracted to such a scheme to help newly qualified teachers find permanent work, but he will be aware that there are a number of, of concerns around uh, some of the proposals. Can I ask the Minister if he's taken advice on some of the equality issues around uh, such a scheme and whether that's led him to reconsider any aspect of it? Uh, my officials have met with uh, the Equality Commission. I have received written advice from the Equality Commission and all those matters are under careful consideration. I have also received legal advice in regards to this matter, and those, that advice is also under careful consideration. And all are playing into uh, the decision-making process. Uh, the, the term discriminatory has been used, and perhaps understandably so, but it has been used in a way to suggest that I am in breach not only of equality legislation, unemployment legislation, but also in breach of the spirit and letter of that legislation. I am confident I am not. I am confident that to proactively target a group of uh, teachers or newly qualified teachers who are finding the greatest difficulty in finding employment does not, is not in breach of equality legislation or employment legislation, either in the letter of the law or in the spirit of the law, because it has to be remembered. The group of teachers who is finding it most difficult to find employment is those who have qualified most recently in the last number of years. Now, I haven't set the number of years as yet, but I am looking at it very carefully and to ensure that the criteria is both lawful and in line with equality legislation. I call Robin Swan. This scheme has been brought about because of too many students graduating from our teacher colleges. Can I ask, has he reduced the number of places Ganinthi, Strand, Mellis and St Mary's and other teaching college providers for the year 16-17 to try and redress this imbalance? Um, I don't see the answer to this question by closing our teacher training colleges. Well, that's what you are saying, in, in fairness, uh, because if we reduce further the number of trainee teachers, then we are actually, by default, closing our teacher training colleges. That's a fact. Uh, and I think it's somewhat unfair for those who call for equality in employment legislation and equality in opportunity to make calls, and I'm not directly referring to the member, who have made calls in recent days saying, will we three and too many teachers close a college or close both colleges? What that really says to me is this. I have my qualifications. I have my opportunity in life. I have my teaching degree. Everybody else can go. Well, there's a number of commentaries from the floor, Deputy Speaker, and if they wish to check uh, articles on various social media, they'll find that it's exactly what has been said, that has been said on the broadcast media as well, and it's been said in correspondence to me. There is those who call for the closure of our teacher training colleges. Do we train too many teachers? Since 2004-2005, when we were training 880 teachers, we have now reduced that by over 30%. Uh, and we're training in around 500-odd uh, teachers at this time. So we are reducing the intake of our teacher training colleges. We're training 500 mainly. We can control the flow, we can control the flow of student teachers into our local teacher colleges. The thing we cannot control is the number of students who go to England and Wales and Scotland to train to be teachers, or who go to the south of Ireland to train to be teachers, and then arrive back here and are seeking employment as teachers and register with the General Teaching Council. We cannot control that. So we can close our teacher training colleges, advise all our young people who want to train as teachers to go to England, Scotland, Wales or the south of Ireland and train, and we lose the economic driver, in my opinion, which is our teacher training colleges, 
and we lose the opportunities that those teacher training colleges give to us to train teachers in our curriculum needs. I call Trevor Lunn and can I remind the Minister of the two minute rule. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I must say I'm absolutely astonished by the Minister's assertion that to replace 500 existing jobs with 500 replacement teachers equates to 500 new jobs. I mean, there's arithmetic here. But uh, in terms of the number of teachers being trained, which seems to be a big issue obviously today, why, why does he not use the numbers determined by his own teacher demand model, the, the, the model used by his department, and stop this nonsense of training far too many teachers? Well, whatever arithmetic you look at, uh, the optimum output of this scheme is that 500 older teachers will leave their posts five to ten years earlier than they would have previously. 500 recently qualified teachers will have employment opportunities they didn't have. They are new jobs, new opportunities. They are refreshing the teacher workforce. They are targeting a group of teachers who are finding the most difficulty in gaining employment in our society. They are new jobs. Now, I could use the voluntary access scheme, which is funding this proposal, to pay off 500 teachers and not replace their jobs, because the education budget, and there's a question later uh, in the debate, is under severe pressure. Severe challenges exist in the education budget. What I have achieved in cooperation with the Department of Finance and Personnel and the Executive who voted on the funding of this scheme is we are using the voluntary access scheme in an imaginative, different way to create employment where employment otherwise would have been lost. So you can describe it in any way, but in my books there are new jobs. And those who fill those posts, I believe they'll see them as new jobs. And those teachers who retire early will be very glad to be vacating them and allowing other uh, teachers into those posts. And this idea that it's nonsense to train teachers, I don't agree with, for the reasons I've outlined to Mr. Swan. Those who are proposing the closure of our teacher training colleges need to look beyond the end of their noses. It's quite clear, and despite even what I said earlier in relation to the, pro the employment prospects, Many, many of our young people want to train as teachers. They will leave these shores and they will go elsewhere, but many of them will come back here and they will still seek employment as teachers. I call Adrian McQuillan. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. How does he prevent teachers who avail of this scheme at the age of 55 from going back and again subbing and, and blocking up the system from the Orient? Um, over this last number of years, due to changes we have made into how uh, retired substitute teachers are paid, and guidance we have issued to boards of governors, we have seen a dramatic reduction in the number of retired teachers coming back into the system uh, as substitute teachers because it's financially not viable for them to do so and also through the guidance we have issued to boards of governors. Boards of governors are now encouraged to uh, seek newly qualified teachers to act as substitutes rather than going back uh, to retired teachers. Now there may be some subject areas where retired teachers in some cases may be beneficial to the school and schools will use them in those circumstances. But certainly due to the changes we have introduced in terms of how uh, substitute teachers who have retired from the service are paid and the gains we have issued to boards of governors, there has been a dramatic reduction in the number of retired teachers returning to substitute teacher cover. I call Jim Alster. The Minister can see that um, the intended bias towards recently qualified teachers, those qualified in the last three years, will have the impact of discriminating against experienced teachers who haven't yet found a permanent post and amounts to writing off those teachers, those with more experience and those perhaps in a, at a stage of life with more responsibilities needing a job even more. Surely the minister needs to review and to ensure that the replacement teachers come from that quota of teachers who have not found permanent jobs, rather than dis discriminating it within that quota. Uh, Mr. knows fine well the language he is using in terms of discrimination. The question that needs to be asked, Mr. Allister, is this, and you as a barrister should know fine well, is the discrimination legal? Is it acceptable and legal under the terms, under the terms of employment legislation and the Equality Act? 
That's the question, and you, I'm sure you have asked yourself this question. No, and I'm, I'm sure you have asked yourself this question, and the fact that you're not standing in the corner lambasting me for acting illegally proves to me, at least, me a mere mortal, me a mere mortal, <laughs> that you have analysed this and you've come to the opinion that the Minister is both acting legally and is acting within the terms and conditions of the Equality Act. Order, order. Can I remind members that remarks should not be made from a sedentary position? Minister, thank you. Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I'm acting in both in the ladder of the law, of equality legislation and employment legislation. Discrimination. The current system discriminates against newly qualified teachers. Those teachers who have qualified in the last three to four years is the cohort of teachers who finds it most difficult to find employment in the teaching profession. So there's clearly an argument that they are being discriminated against. When the shortlisting takes place in schools and they seek teaching experience over a three or four year period, those cohort of newly qualified teachers are discriminated against legally, but they find it most difficult to find employment. The scheme I am proposing gives those teachers an opportunity to apply for posts there will still be approximately around 500 other posts which come on stream every year for all cohort of teachers to apply to, and I hope uh, and wish them all success in doing so. But at the end of the day, whether it's the newly qualified teacher scheme or the other teachers' posts, it's up to the Board of Governors to make that employment. I call Oliver McMullen. Can I get never to the question five? Following the Executive's agreement on Budget 1617 on the 17th of December 2015, my department has been allocated a total capital budget of uh, 183,000,000.7. This allocation includes 20.3 million of capital funding from the Economic Pact, which funds the projects agreed under the Together Building a United Community Initiative. The total capital budget for 1617 represents an increase of 46.9 million on the opening 2015-16 capital allocation. I am currently working through the impact of the budget 1617 outcome on the education sector and finalising allocations to specific capital programmes. I anticipate, however, that the uplift in the 2016-17 capital budget will ensure that all of the major work projects due to progress under or progress to construction in 16-17 financial year will have the required capital funding in place to do so. It will also allow the much of the backlog and minor work schemes which built up as a result of this year's constrained budget to be cleared. The improved budget position will also facilitate the re release of additional school enhancement programmes, schemes for construction. Overall, this increase in capital funding will yield only positive results for the school estate and for our local economy. I call Oliver McNaughton for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his question. Minister, what's that there? How much of the backlog of the minor works programme will this be able to, to reduce? Um, we will be able to work our way through the backlog quite significantly. Uh, and I'm talking in relation to a backlog that was built up last year as a result of what was a reduction in our capital budget last year. Now, saying that, every year more minor works come online. Um, there will be minor works processing through the system at this stage. And uh, I would always be happy to lobby for and gain more capital funds to move our, our minor works projects forward. But we did face significant issues and, and problems with minor works this year. I, I do believe we will be able to deal with the backlog that was, was in the system as we move forward. And as I said, and the, the SEP scheme, the, the school enhancement programme, which has been very beneficial to the schools of state, more of those will be released uh, in the weeks and months ahead as well. I call John Dallet. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for, for his answer. Uh, gazing into his crystal ball, could the Minister perhaps give us an indication when schools like St Paul's and Kilray and St Mary's and Claddy will have the new building they were promised if they went out of existence in uh, return for a new build? Um, the, the danger always during question time when an issue around capital budgets is raised that I, each individual MLA will step up, and quite understandably ask about projects in their own constituency. Unfortunately, I can neither carry the paperwork or store all that information in my head uh, moving forward. I'm more than happy to forward the, the information on to the member, however. Call Danny Kennedy. <coughs> Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, when does the Minister expect uh, to make uh, any announcement on a capital schools programme 
before the end of this mandate? Uh, I hope to be in a position to make a capital schools announcement in relation to primary school sector before the end of this mandate. Uh, and I'm making that announcement because in the delivery of primary schools, the, the capital expenditure, expenditure is less on each project and they are quicker to deliver. Um, it will be up to future ministers uh, to make announcements about across the range of post-primary and primary uh, and nursery and, and youth facilities for which the Department of Education is responsible for. We have quite an extensive building programme already on ground. I will be making a, a further announcement about school enhancement programmes uh, in relation to those who have applied, but we did not have the, the capital funds to move them forward. I hope to be in a position to move a number of those forward in the weeks and months ahead as well. I call Stephen Ingew. You, Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister whether he has any monies for capital bills um, for shared and integrated as a result of fresh, uh, the Fresh Start deal um, within this financial year? Uh, my cup runneth over. Uh, as a result of the Stormont House Agreement, uh, funding for the uh, shared education programmes and integrated education programmes is averaging around £50 million a year. We are moving those discussions as part of that agreement. We have discussions with the DEFP and the Treasury as to how the funds are used. Those discussions are moving forward uh, well, uh, and we will be in a position to move those projects forward, starting to move those projects forward within this financial year uh, when we conclude the, the discussions with those three interested parties. But I'm, I'm more than satisfied as to how those discussions are going, and integrated and shared education is in for a significant boost to, to its estate. I call Gordon Dunn. Question six, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The budget 1617 outcome for education is challenging, partly as a result of the real terms reduction to the executive's resource Dale position imposed by the Westminster Government. Following the executive's agreement of budget 1617 on Thursday, the 17th of December 2015, I am currently working through the impact of the budget 2016-17 outcome on the education sector and have not yet come to any final decisions on the 16-17 budget allocations. However, although the budget 16-17 resource outcome is challenging, as I have stated, the position uh, for capital in education is much better. My aim is to have reached final decisions on my department's 16-17 budget allocation as soon as possible to allow for early notification uh, to schools and other bodies. I call Gordon Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Does he recognise that the proposed cuts, and I recognise that they are proposed at this stage, of 3.8%, which equates to approximately £72 million in the resource budget, is a real risk to the teaching profession and the possible loss of teachers, making the management of schools for boards of governors a real challenge? Um, all of the executive's budgets are facing a huge challenge, but I don't point the finger of blame at any of the executive parties. I point the finger of blame at economic decisions and policy decisions being made in Westminster. I believe the executive has recognised the importance of education within our society. They have done their best as a collective to protect the education budget with competing priorities, for instance, in regards to health. But still, the education budget still uh, is able to um, receive uplifts, um, which other departments, I think, will be very, very happy to uh, to be dealing with, and even in terms of the scale of, of the cut to education budgets, not in comparison to what other departments are facing. It's worth noting, however, that even in terms of the voluntary access scheme and how it was used last year, school budgets this year save over £12 million because of the number of staff that left the service last year, which means that schools have £12 million less in terms of wages and salary costs to pay out this year. The Education Authority has around £7 million savings in that area. If uh, the scheme which we, we debated at length earlier in question time is fulfilled, we can make up to around £9 million of savings there. So there are areas where we can recoup some of the losses to the, or to the school's budget, but I am conscious that any dip to the, to the school budget causes challenges for our schools. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his responses. Um, will the Minister make any commitment uh, that the aggregated schools budget, the, the, the money that goes directly to your frontline services uh, of teaching in schools, will not be cut in the 2016-2017 budget? Um, as I said uh, to Mr Dunn, I am working my way through the budget. 
I cannot make commitments to any sector at this stage in relation to what will be protected or will not be protected. Moving forward, though, it's worth reminding members that this is now the fifth year where the education budget and indeed the executive budget has seen a downward trend. Uh, much of the low-hanging fruit, fruit has been uh, removed in previous budgets. We are now dealing with uh, the core budgets around aggregated schools budget, funding uh, to the EEA and funding to other organisations. So I, I cannot make a commitment at this stage to any, uh, to, to any of those operating under any of the budget headlines that they will not face uh, reductions in their spend this year. I call Conor Murphy. Thank for his answers today. I appreciate his attempt to defend his budget in the, in the face of the uh, Conservative government's onslaught on, on public spending and on, on, on frontline services. Uh, but he will appreciate that schools, uh, in, in uncertain circumstances, would like to, to know as soon as they possibly can. I, I know he did allude in his answer to soon being able to uh, let schools know what their budget. Would he have any idea of when that actually might be? Uh, I'm working on the basis of weeks at this stage rather than months. Uh, I have been in deliberations with my officials. Uh, over this, since we have the executive set its budget, um, and I hope to be in a position within the next short number of weeks to inform schools of what their budgets will be for the next year. Moving on, I will call Adrian Cotton Watson. Uh, when a control school closes, the Education Authority will firstly consider if it has any further use for the premises. Once the EA confirms the property is surplus to its requirements, my department then determines if there is any other educational use for the property. If none is determined, the EA will commence the formal disposal process with the approval of my department. Disposal is in line with the guidelines in the Land and Property Services document, Central Advisory Unit's Disposal of Surplus Public Sector Property in NA, March 2013. These guidelines apply to all government departments. When a voluntary grammar or maintained or a grant maintained integrated school closes, responsibility reverts to the trustees and it is for them to determine whether to dispose of the property or not. I call Adrian Cochran Watson for something. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, uh, thank you for the response and you've made great play of reusing school premises such as the old Liston Ski High School site. Um, has your department an equality proof policy? Can he assure the House? In the case of the Listening Nelly Stroll project, the proceeds occurring from the sale of sites of those schools who were moving on to the Stroll campus will be treated equally and the taxpayer will be protected? Uh, I can assure the member of that, and as I referred to him in my original answer, uh, my department, as with every other department, has to work under the, the guidance from the Central Advisory Unit uh, in relation to the, the disposal of surplus public sector property, uh, and where there is schools falling under other managing authorities, for instance, maybe the maintained or perhaps the voluntary sector, where there has been grant payments in the past, there is a clawback uh, policy in place, so all public funds are protected in that regard. I call Rob Newton. Speaker, um, the disposal of the property, uh, uh, Minister, goes in line with the disposable disposal of the building or the potential future use of the building. And so often that either potential future use or the eventual clearance of the site takes such a long period of time that the building itself becomes a blight on the area or indeed uh, becomes a, a place for young people, vandals together and create, create nuisance. Can I ask the Minister, is there a time scale within which that decision-making process should be completed so that the two scenarios I've outlined do not, in fact, become uh, the, the problems for those who live close by? There is no timescale uh, in place in relation to the disposal of assets, but there are two factors which encourage the disposal of those assets. Uh, one is that um, the authorities, which, whichever category they are, continue to have to pay rates on them. And security also becomes an issue for them, and insurance also becomes uh, an issue for them. So, in many cases, uh, the managing authority of the premises, it's in their best interest to dispose of the property or land as quickly as possible. And that is the end of the period for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mrs. Karen McEvitt.
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister what steps his department has taken to ensure that every pupil is given an opportunity uh, to be trained in CPR in order to create a generation of lifesavers? Um, as the member will be aware, we have, within the curriculum, it's perfectly uh, feasible and possible for schools to teach uh, first aid and CPR, and many of our schools avail of the services such as the, of the British Heart Foundation, St John's Ambulance, uh, and, and other organisations to carry out training in CPR, to carry out um, basic training in first aid, etc. So there's, uh, there's a wealth of opportunities for schools to avail of, but as our curriculum, we present the curriculum to the schools. It's up to the schools as to how they uh, deliver the materials for that curriculum. Uh, um, can I thank the Minister uh, for his response? Is the Minister then saying that it is already in the compulsory curriculum for schools that children should have that training um, opportunity? No, I, I, I'm not saying that. I'm, what I'm saying is there is the opportunity within the curriculum for schools to teach first aid. Uh, and quite recently I met with the Cormac Allen Trust, another organisation. Uh, that is providing uh, CPR training to schools and indeed providing defibrillators to schools they are working with. The, what I'm saying is the curriculum is set out. Within that curriculum, schools can use much materials and interpretation of that curriculum as they feel fit. First aid can be delivered through our curriculum. It is up to the Board of Governors of the school as to what part of the curriculum they deliver in these areas. Uh, but I would encourage schools to partake in CPR training. I would encourage schools to take part in first aid, uh, and as I've said, there's many organisations out there availing of that service. I call Michael McJim Singh. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the uh, Minister, in reference to the uh, secondary school in South Belfast, the last state secondary school in South Belfast at Breda, uh, that he announced new build for that school once the amalgamation went through? That announcement was in July 2014. Can he tell me if there's been any further progress? There has been project across a range of our capital building programmes. Um, I, as I said as an earlier member, I, I can't carry the information around in all of the capital building programmes moving forward, but any capital build programme I have announced, uh, there's progress being made. It takes, unfortunately, to spend tens of millions of pounds of public funds, it takes a period of time to get all the approvals in place, the business case in place planning approval in place and ensuring that the design uh, of the school is what is required moving forward, etc. Et All that takes a period of time uh, before actual diggers are seen on site. I call Michael Jim say. Can I say, uh, Deputy Speaker, I'm disappointed with that answer. I have to say that when my name appeared on topical questions, I would be surprised if the Minister's officials didn't come forward with a suggested list of topics that I was liable to ask. That's the whole point of topical questions. Can I remind the Minister uh, and ask the Minister that as far as Breed is concerned, it's a school designed for 850 pupils. It's now sitting at 1,000. Is there not an urgency here now to provide an appropriate building? No. My understanding of topical questions was that it was about policy issues and news stories which have come to light in recent times. It's not to do with the constituency needs of each individual MLA. And that's my understanding. I, I may be wrong in that regard. And my officials did come forward with a list of possible questions which you may ask. But I have to say, the one we opted for was in relation to the amalgamation of three primary schools in South Belfast. So you, congratulations, you've caught us out on that one. I call Declan McAleer. Um, Graham Margaret. Um, could the Minister provide a uh, progress update on the Struil Education Campus? Uh, the Struil Education Campus is moving forward as planned. Uh, development work and building work has started in relation to Arvilly Special Needs School. The member will also be aware that the site clearance is well advanced in relation to the Struil Education Campus. Uh, we expect to be on, on uh, completion in around uh, 2020 and moving forward. So I am satisfied that all progress required is being made on the Struid site. I call Declan McAleer for something. Uh, I'm going to thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, I understand that uh, a key development for progressing the campus is the development of the Strathroy Link Road. Could the Minister, would the Minister be in a position to provide an update on this particular project? The Department is working with Transport NI to progress the Strathroy Link Road, which is a key element of the campus traffic management solution. 
Transport NA published the draft vesting order in November 2015. Public consultation has been completed and no objections were received. The procurement process for the contractor is scheduled to commence at the end of March 2016. Work on the site is scheduled to commence in January 2017 with completion by April 2018. I call Fergal McElkinney. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can thank the Minister. Uh, can I ask the Minister, could he update the House on the AQA and OCR exam board's decisions not to offer GCSE uh, subjects for students here? Um, AQA has confirmed in writing that they will no longer provide uh, qualifications here. OCR have indicated verbally, but they have not provided any written confirmation to date uh, that they are not prepared to provide the qualifications as required by our system. In that context, what assurances can uh, the Minister give that students here, uh, uh, that all subjects are, sorry, that are currently offered, will continue to be available uh, post-September 2016 and that no student will be disproportionately impacted uh, by these decisions? Uh, as part of my deliberations around uh, the decision to remain with A star to G grading, uh, it was always in the back of my mind that those, what is referred to as the English Qualifications Bodies, may uh, remove their services, uh, and that has been the case. So planning has been in place now uh, for a period of time in preparation for if such a statement came about. I hope to be in a position to communicate directly with schools this week or early next week in relation to the plans that are in place, and I can assure the member that none of our students will be disadvantaged as a result of what has been a commercial decision uh, by one of the awarding bodies, and we await written confirmation from the other. I call Trevor Clark. Right. Uh, question. Sorry, um, Minister, I'm, I'm actually surprised we're getting to question five and sorry, question four before someone raised the subject in terms of the, uh, the qualifications. However, are you minded to make any form of review, given I noticed in my own local paper today the headlines from three principals right across the sector and their concerns about how it is actually disadvantaging children? Have you any plans actually to review that and review the decision that you have made? I, I share the member's surprise that we've reached question four, but some, somebody asked me about a policy question, because I thought topical questions were about policy questions, but I never. Uh, I have, when we've got formal notification from uh, one of the bodies, AQA, I reviewed the information at hand to me and to my original decision to move or to stay with A star to G. And I still believe that that was the right decision for our education system, the right decision for our young people. And as I said to Mr McKinney, I was always in the back of my mind that the, what's known as the English awarding bodies may re remove their, their services from here. And there was plans prepared or put in place for that. There are different opinions in education around a range of matters, and that's the reality of the situation. There are school principals who are opposed to my decision. There are school principals who support it. There are others who have varying views on this matter. But I can assure everyone that no young person will be put at a disadvantage as a result of AQA or and if OCR decide to re remove themselves from our qualifications. We have plans in place. Those young people will be able to study the same wide range of subjects, and those qualifications will be portable and robust. I call Trevor Clark. I, I to a degree I accept what the Minister is saying about the disadvantage of the children. I mean I believe it won't affect the educational standards within our schools. However, surely the Minister will accept that when employers are looking at grades where, where young people actually come out of schools, that it's those grades that actually the employers are looking for. So given that these are English exam bodies, employers, large firms that actually employ Great employment in Northern Ireland is going to affect them. So, is the Minister minded to look more at this rather than disadvantage the employment opportunities for our young people moving forward? No, uh, there's, there's no evidence to support that our young people will be disadvantaged in, in seeking employment. Unless they reintroduce Hadrian's Wall in Britain, Scottish students are going to continue to travel from Scotland into England. They will be travelling with totally different qualifications than those students in England have, because Scotland has its own exams body and its own exam system. England still remains with the GCSEs. The Welsh have decided to remain with the A star to G, so they have the same system as we have. Welsh students and Welsh young people seeking employment travel into England and vice versa. And I'm acutely aware that our young people travel to England seeking employment and that there's large English employing organisations here who will be looking at our qualifications. All of those bodies are used to looking at a wide range of qualifications, not only from these islands, but from across Europe, and have not shown any difficulty to date to understanding either the changes in GCSEs or the qualifications which come here from across Europe. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. 
Would the minister recognise that his recent comments, and I know it was touched on earlier, that he made some weeks ago that no one should enter the teaching profession in the belief that they would come out on the other side and obtain full-time employment. They were negative and discouraging for young people aspiring to be teachers. Well, uh, there are several members of the chamber who are telling me that we are training too many teachers. I think it was a responsible thing for a minister to stand up and say, and I made it very clear from the outset, I cannot and I will not give individual careers advice. But I advise anyone who is considering taking up teaching to carefully consider all their options and also to, to recognise that when they feature, finish their teaching qualification, there may not be full-time employment available for them. I think that's a responsible thing to tell a young person who is considering a career pathway. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Chairman. I think it's somewhat disappointing. Is it the case that the Minister will be looking for part-time teachers only from now here on in? No, I, I will be looking uh, to maintain the education budget. I will be looking to ensure that the executive, and I believe that uh, at least the two major parties in the executive, recognise the benefits of maintaining our education system moving forward and doing everything within their power within a limited budget to maintain it moving forward. I will be introducing schemes such as I'm, I, I'm proposing to introduce uh, in the time ahead in relation to recruiting uh, a new cohort of teachers. And I most certainly do want to see a system where we end up with part-time teachers. What I want to see is a system where young people who are making career choices have all the information at hand. And then when they make that career choice, they, were, they make it in the basis of being fully informed of the employment potential at the end of it. I call Pam Cameron. Cameron. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if he can um, give me an indication of what the current area-based planning um, at post-primary level process is and um, when he thinks decisions will be made on that? Uh, areas, uh, the old education library boards have published their area plans. They remain in place under the Education Authority. Decisions are being made uh, in regards to um, future school enrolment, school building programmes, uh, and the future of the delay of the school estate based on the area planning uh, proposals that have been published. They are under review, they are under constant review, um, and will never remain as, a as, as, uh, as the one shape going into the future. There will always be a period of review and reflection upon them. But area planning is a reality. It's taking place and decisions are made based upon it. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, obviously, I'm concerned with um, the provision of post-16 education within the Antrim area in particular because it's, there are not a lot of choices for, for pupils to remain locally there. And um, I'm really interested to hear when he believes um, some decisions may be made um, in, in particular to that area of, of Antrim. Well, th th these are matters for the EA to finalise on. Uh, there are areas within uh, our schools provision where I have concerns about post-16 provision and the, the equitability of either transfer to that or access to that, and, and the member has mentioned Antrim. Um, I will seek further information from the Education Authority to ensure that they are moving ahead uh, purposefully in relation to post-16 provision in the Antrim area to, share, and to ensure that all young people have access to high-quality A-level provision. I call Adrian McCullen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, Mr. St Patrick's and Joseph's Primary School, based in Glen Allen and Garwa, where two schools brought together uh, under uh, a federation, bringing the two schools together, and now they operate across two sites. Uh, on Downey Street management, at the end of March 2015, the school had a surplus of £57,000, and they were told by the Education Authority that, that they wouldn't be receiving any funding. And, you know, is this not wrong, because it's street management where they saved this money? Um, well, it, it's difficult to answer, because I don't know in relation to the amount of money the member refers to, whether that's in line with the agreed surplus the school should have. Uh, schools can carry a surplus of up to 5 per cent, or a deficit of up to 5 per cent. And given that we are living in very constrained times, the Education Authority has been working with, and in some cases challenging schools, over the amount of surplus they carry. Now, I'm not suggesting that is the case here, but I do know in other cases that uh, the Education Authority has been pointing out to schools that either their surplus is beginning to get out of control, for want of a better term, or their deficit is in a similar scenario as well. 
And that is the end of our period for questions to the Minister of Education. Could I ask members to take their ease for a few moments? Sorry, point, point of order. I apologise for missing a daddy question yesterday. It was administrative hours. I was at a British Irish Committee meeting.